Man, it doesn't matter about what anybody else is going to bring. It matters what I'm bringing. It's Julian Marquez up here, the Cuban Missile Crisis. He's coming to bring the excitement, the entertainment, what everybody's been waiting 30 months, 31 months for. They've been waiting for a person like me. The UFC's been asking for me. That's the reason why they put me on the number one spot in the card, on the card, besides the main event. You look, I'm opening the pay-per-view card. That's the number one spot where everyone looks. Everyone watches. The moment you put money into something, you pay hard attention to that first fight. They're ready for it. The world's ready for it. How we doing? What's up, man? <laughs> Living a dream. Seven and two. It's your record. Fighting Mackie Patello is 13 and seven. You're on the main card. Pay-per-view. Is this your first pay-per-view? This is my first pay-per-view. Okay. Correct. I've talked to like Jeff Molina, and uh, he said that Grant would say it always just feels like another fight when you're when you're doing it. Do you share that sentiment or? Being on the pay-per-view, does that psych you up more? This is the thing, man, I've been fighting for a long time. I have over 20 fights. Um, granted, I've been out for 31 months. I've been dreaming of this moment. I've been wanting this moment. Everything is coming into play. I feel ready. I feel excited. I feel energetic. The thing is, is that this fight is literally no different than any other fight. It's just how you perceive it. If you were to look at it like it's the greatest thing in the world, then yeah, it can be, but they can add a lot of pressure on that. A fight's a fight. You know, you're gonna get punched, he's gonna get punched. You might take him down, he might take you down. You have to be ready for everything. You have to calm yourself. It's just, it's business. Yeah, so it is gonna be a big night. Second pay-per-view of the year. How does it feel, or what do you think the energy will be like on a Usman versus Burns uh, pay-per-view? You, you opening the card, what do you think that whole night's energy is gonna be like? Man, it doesn't matter about what anybody else is gonna bring, it matters what I'm bringing. It's Julian Marquez up here, the Cuban Missile Crisis. He's coming to bring the excitement, the entertainment, what everybody's been waiting 30 months, 31 months for. They've been waiting for a person like me. The UFC's been asking for me. That's the reason why they put me on the number one spot in the card, on the card, besides the main event. You look, I'm opening the pay-per-view card. That's the number one spot where everyone looks. Everyone watches. The moment you put money into something, you pay hard attention to that first fight. They're ready for it. The world's ready for it. Let's talk about what kept you out for those 31 months. You know, your latissimus dorsi injury. Do you like talking about it? Is it a part of your past? Is it a part of your future? Or is it just a part of, you know, the, the Julian Marquez story? It's who I am. That thing. I snapped my lap off the bone, the tendon off the bone, throwing a punch. The amount of power that I push off of these hands is enough to shatter a bone, to break a, a tendon, to rip it off. I'm the one person in the entire history of the UFC to ever have this thing happen to them. It happens in MLB players when they overextend their arm, when they throw that super ridiculous 110 mile fastball. I know that's not real, but when they throw a fastball, their arm gets overextended from the body and it tears the lat. They've never seen it severed completely, where they had to attach two anchors and put the lat back into the arm. And that happened to you? Yep. That happened July 6, 2018. And I know that the doctor told you that I saw this on MMA Junkie that you may never fight again. Yep. If you could take me back to that moment, did you believe those words? Did you believe him or did you always know, you know, um, I'm going to grind this thing out and I'll be back in the UFC eventually? You just don't know. It was one it. of those things that in that moment I, I was, we, we were in PT every single day. We're, uh, you know, over a year in, we didn't understand what was going on with the arm. We were lifting it up, we tried to move it. We were talking about second surgery. No, we just got done with the second surgery, actually. Got done with the second surgery, go in there to remove scar tissue, which they end up removing a giant block, like literally the size of a quarter. There was a, a scar tissue that was put on the quarter, uh, on like the head of my shoulder. So every time I lifted it up, once it got to a point, it would hit that scar tissue inside, you know, your shoulder, and then it would dislocate my shoulder and then pop it back in place. So my arm would hitch every time I lifted it up. So they went in, cut that out, but it wasn't coming back. The frozen shoulder is what I ended up getting adhesive capsulitis um, from just the immobility of my arm for the healing process of the severed tendon that it just, it built up a lot of stuff. I'm like Wolverine, I overhealed myself. The second surgery, I overhealed myself again. That frozen shoulder was not going away. 
there's no time. It could happen for eight months. It could happen for eight years. And he was like looking at it. We were trying to move it. He's like, man, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I'm sitting there in Chicago, inside a cold room, stepmom's there. He goes, well, we could try this last thing. And if it doesn't work, we may decide of going a different route. You know, you're gonna have to figure out a different career path. And my heart sunk into myself. I remember going back to this hotel that we were staying at and uh, we had the TV on. I just remember sleeping and just not wanting to wake up that whole entire night. Like literally my appointment was at one o'clock in the afternoon and I just remember waking up the next day. Like literally I was just trying to sleep the whole entire time. I wouldn't get out of the bed, wouldn't move. It was a very sad moment. And then after that I was like, you know what? Doctors are supposed to give you the most accurate information that they can give that's going to protect them. And I'm not saying anything bad about mm -hmm. him and that it's not going to work or he doesn't know, but they're supposed to protect themselves. They can't say you can never fight again. They can't say that you can never be healed again. They can't say any of that. They could just say what they perceive is going to be accurate. Like, eh, you may be not be able to use it, but you might have to look at a gift. So I just... I knew it, it's not it's not the end of it. I just got to keep going. And look at you now, you know, a week away from opening a pay-per-view slot. So Let's go. That's amazing. And you had a bit of a journey to get down to 185. Um, what was that journey like? Who helped you out to, on this, creating this version of Julian Marquez that we're seeing? This you know, in fucking model body, this Greek god body that's going to be bestowed in front of you on pay-per-view. People are yes. paying to look at this figure, this beard, this face, this everything. That journey was a wild one. During the time off, I had about, I mean, we had over two years off. And the first year was, you know, we're still trying to stay within the weight. I was around two. 15 to 220 just staying in shape running doing all this stuff doing all these challenges then the second year it was like well we don't even know when we're coming back we're talking about a second surgery and that's whenever i went on a uh, grow your hair out and um eat a lot of food it was a, it was a phase in my life that i just let my hair grow let my mustache fly and eat as much food as i could and uh ended up going from 215 to 225 225 to 235, 235 to 245, and the highest I saw was 252, I think. Um, and I came in June, May. Came in May to Glory MMA and Fitness in Kansas City. Uh, I, I spoke with the coaches out here. The pandemic really pushed me away from Vegas because a lot of things were locked down. During the time, uh, Glory was training and going there. I just got released in 2020 of January. So right when I get released to be able to compete again, my arm's good, all the gyms shut down. And I didn't want to go another year after it. So I came here, James, uh, James Krause, the coach here at Glory, invited me into his home with his family and kept me there for three months. We did a fight camp with him. I lived at his house. I checked my weight every day. Tyler Minton did my nutrition. I weighed everything by the gram. So my first camp I did that didn't happen with uh, Saparov is I was living at James' house and every morning I would send my weight to him. I'd show James. Every morning, everything I would sit there and weigh, eat, make sure I was on liquid. James was on me like a, a bad out of Literally like fly on shit. Every time, anything I did incorrect, my weight fluctuated. Point three, James is commenting. What, what's going on? Why are you going on? Well, what the hell happened, this, that, and the other. And we ended up getting down to uh, 203, 10 days out, and the fight didn't happen. And then the next camp, the same exact thing. We got all the way down to 186. Um, this time, James was a little bit more laid back on the way. He, mm -hmm. he got us down there. Uh, I know Michael Chandler like had a good, I guess, uh, wording on it. He said it was a good dress rehearsal for him and Fight Island, going down, making the weight. In his case, he kind of knew that he wasn't going to actually fight with, with Gaethje and, and Khabib. For you, you make weight and it, you, are, you were supposed to fight. Was it a good dress rehearsal or was it kind of mentally frustrating that it didn't end up happening. So this is the thing you have to you have to understand. Like, I spent at the time it was 20, 24 months out of the game, mm -hmm. almost two, a little over two years actually, maybe twenty six months out of the game. 
my whole life was dreaming of getting back. Everything I was doing was getting back. Every time I went to PT and struggled and went through the pain, it was getting back to that moment. And when I came here to Kansas City to the glory, James taught me something that it, it, the value of it is beyond what any fighter can educate themselves on. James didn't teach me to fight. James taught me how to enjoy the process of it. Enjoy the grind, enjoy the mental uh, side of it, enjoy the battles, enjoy the small victories. So when I came down to the fight and we're walking up to, to go to Wayne's the day of and I get a call and they say Saparov's out, the fight's off. Right before, I would, I would say it was like, man, that sucks. But I stepped on the scale and I was 186 on the dot. I, was, I, I missed weight my last fight, remember? Let's say 31 months ago I missed weight and it was just everyone's bashing on you. I tore my arm out. Everything it was like the worst moment that you can have. I had a triple threat. I lost my fight, I missed weight, and I tore my out and my arm off. That was the last feeling I had of the MMA world. And now the last feeling I have of the MMA world is I did everything right, I enjoyed the process and I made the weight. So regardless if I didn't fight him, I won that fight. The process got me to that fight. I was healthy, I was ready to rock, and I felt phenomenal, and I made the weight. So it was a, it was a victory to me. That's what I look at it. I didn't, just because he wasn't there and I didn't fight him doesn't mean I didn't win. I won, I, I, you gotta enjoy the small things. Like I said last night, I was doing an interview. Have you seen the movie Soul in Disney? It's a new one, no, I haven't. So it's a new movie. If you watch the movie, the movie's amazing. It's about a uh, musician that always wanted to be a musician. It's always about, and he's focused on a musician, and all he can ever see is a musician. He ends up dying at the beginning of the movie. He goes through the whole process, and he sees himself on the outside. He sees everything on the outside. And he teams up with another, like, mythical, like, ghost or whatever that's supposed to guide you through life. Well, this person's never been to Earth and he wants to get back to Earth because he finally hits a big break of whatever he dreamed of to be the musician he wants to do. He finally goes down there and this mythical creature takes over his body and lives his life. And at the end of it, she basically is enjoying the fact that a leaf is falling. She's enjoying the fact that, you know, that hot dogs taste like hot dogs. Cheese is the most greatest thing in the world. Whereas this guy was so focused on this music and his career in music that he didn't realize that it's beautiful to see a leaf fall, the taste of this, to have a conversation outside of music with somebody else, like the moments, it really, it's a really deep movie, but basically it's enjoying the things around you and stop being tunnel vision for a fight. So that was, yeah, the perspective of it was, it was absolutely amazing and it's the same thing James teaches here in Glory, he teaches you how to enjoy the entire process, the entire thing to make sure you don't just focus on the fight, focus on all the great things you're doing in a time. I mean, look, I was 252, fat looking slob. I didn't look at a photo, it was disgusting. And then I looked at myself on a weigh in photo and put it side by side with what I was a year prior. And that process, the, the grind, the struggle it was, but the enjoyment I had of looking at everything that I've done and accomplished in there, it's, it's worth its weight in gold. Let's talk about your new opponent, Mackie Coconut Bomb Spatolo. He likes to stand, you like to stand. I mean, something's gotta give, right? Yeah, somebody does gotta give, but the thing is, is that I am far fierce than any middleweight is. I hit way harder. If you try to stand in front of me, you're going down. I could do anything and everything I want to mock Because he thinks 31 months ago, Junior. He thinks training with the same people I trained 31 months ago. I'm a different breed, I'm a different person. You know, James Krause taught me the who, what, where's, and why's, how to cross T's and how to dot I's. He's created a monster. And I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna show everybody and show Maki why you don't forget about something. And you have a common opponent in Darren Stewart. I know maybe some fighters, some coaches may look at this particular fight as a, as a peak of interest. Do you personally look at those two fights of him versus Darren Stewart and you versus Darren Stewart and look at that a little bit closer than maybe his other body of work? Or do you, you know, not carry your focus on yourself? Um, 
or just you know who he is, you know what you're gonna get from him. Uh, I don't. I I have the coach that looks at the film. And I, mm -hmm. I watch film and stuff, but I don't ever judge a person by the MMA match. One fight. You know, if I I beat Darren Stewart, Darren Stewart beat him. You know, if we go through that, then you know, one of the greatest fighters in the world is Eric Spicy. Eric Spicy finished Tiago Santos. Tiago Santos went all the way up and fought John Jones and arguably won, fought, two torn out legs, but that's the MMA math, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's one that comes to mind. Um, Anthony Smith. Anthony Smith, if you put it a world champ, Nate Marquardt would be a world champion, should be a world champion, because he knocked out uh, Tyron's, uh, Tyron Woodley. You know, if you go through all that whole entire MMA math, it, a fighter has a good day and has a bad day. Sometimes it's not that, they're, it doesn't define the fighter, it's just the event. And I know uh, James Lynch asked you this question, but so shout out to him. But I'm gonna go a little bit deeper. Uh, you get good looks in the gym like this, but multiple different looks. I know you said J Jason Witt is your main kind of training partner in this yeah. camp, but you're also working with Jason High, uh, Grant Dawson on the ground, and then obviously James Krause on a little bit of everything. How important has that been in your process, but in this camp especially? So when I, I used to train, I used to train with you know, two people or, you know, one person. Mm -hmm. And I'll get their mentality on it and the way they went. And A person didn't like what B person does and they would try to uncorrect B person and do this. So it, I was battling against two coaches trying to tell me what I should and what I shouldn't do, saying this person's wrong, this person's wrong. And it basically created this, this kid that is fighting and basically just going off of what he feels in a fight and not knowing what to do. We're... When you're here with like Grant Dawson, he's a phenomenal grappler. He's a phenomenal mixed martial artist. And he has a lot of knowledge in there. And he can give you little pointers and tips that, you know, work on a plethora of people. But sometimes he doesn't have that angle that Jason I might have with his experience in jiu-jitsu and everything where it would resonate with me and they're on the same page they both say the same exact concept it's just a different verbiage mm -hmm. or a different way that resonates with you and the same thing goes with the striking with Austin Ford teaching it and James Krause James would teach it one way and you're like I kind of get it and Austin goes into this just this philosophical way and for some reason that resonates way more than the actual just telling me hey just throw this this and this he'll go into and explain it and you're just like okay so it's just these different people that are all working on the same exact you know game plan the same exact way a strike should be thrown the same exact way a takedown should be all of them funneled in together to where it makes sense and very different and you get to see different looks and different perspectives and it's just it levels you up when everybody's on your team. Mm -hmm. Austin Ford, great coach. I forgot to mention him. So, best case scenario, how does this fight play out? Do you have you envisioned this fight and how it may end? Yeah, I envision this fight a thousand times. I've watched this fight. I'm sure it's like millions. I envisioned this fight since you know I first got injured and lost my last fight, all the way to the first time I, I weighed in again, the second time I weighed in. This fight has came over and over and over and over. Thing is is it's going to be exciting, it's going to be great, and it's going to be my hand raised. It doesn't matter if it goes standing, it doesn't matter if it goes to the ground. If it stays standing, it's going to be a quick night for him. If it stays, or if it goes to the ground, it's going to be a quick night. I mean, just I'm taking him out. That's it. These Miley Cyrus fan accounts are, uh, they're becoming pretty big fans of yours because oh, yeah. you're going to walk out to a, a song by Miley Cyrus. Is this true, or are you, you going to turn your back on? Are you kidding me? First off, don't ever. Don't you ever come at me and say I'm gonna turn my back on my Miley. I have been walking out to Miley Cyrus songs for a long time. Right. Wrecking Ball has been one of, like, in Kansas City when I was an amateur, I walked out to Wrecking Ball right when it came popular, and I hit a Wrecking Ball finish, a, literally a knee from heaven all the way down to hell, brought it all the way through, hit the guy in his uh, liver, and it was done. And he was grounded by the way. So everyone just did the wrecking ball was there. And I walked out to it um, in my headphones when I was on the contender series. I walked out to it in a fight with Alessio. This thing is, Miley a few months back did a cover, I think it was on Saturday Night Live, of Blondie's Heart of Glass. Blondie's Heart of Glass is freaking amazing. It's one of the best, the best songs out there. And Blondie's just, she's a queen. 
So she covered it and absolutely killed it. And I needed that on streaming. So I put out a tweet. I said, Miley, if you put this out on streaming, I'm fucking walking out to my next fight. This would have happened on the Sabaroff 1 mm -hmm. and the Sabaroff 2. But now we're, we're stuck here. She put it out. She ended up getting there. All the fans were just tweeting it. We went over 500,000 uh, likes and shares on it, on Twitter. And we ended up getting it streamed. And I'm going to hold my promise to, these, to, the, to my fans, to my friends, to my, my Miley Cyrus lovers. We're in this all day together. The middleweight division also is in a pretty good state. Out of these three fights, what's your favorite one on paper? Uh, Darren Till versus Marvin Vittori, Robert Whitaker and uh, Paulo Costa, or uh, Derek Brunson and Kevin Holland. So the middleweight division has been doing fantastic. Mick Maynard is amazing. He saved the middleweight division. He's also blown up the 125 pound division, flyweight division to make it exciting. Mick is an amazing matchmaker, so props to him. But if we're going to go, we're going to do Marvin Vittori and uh, Darren Till. Marvin looked impressive in his last fight. He did good against a guy that doesn't really do a lot of good striking and always fold and folds. Um, but the thing is, is that Darren Till, if you take Darren Till down, it's you could have a good night. But Darren Till's striking is absolutely underrated. If you watch some of the technique that he throws, I, it's, I'm very impressed by him. I'm very, very impressed by him. I think uh, Darren Till in that one, you know, Marvin took a lot of hits in that last fight. I don't know if he could be taking that many type of hits or if he can get cut up by an elbow with the style that Darren Till has. Uh, and then we go to um, Paulo Costo versus Robert Whitaker. It just depends on Robert Whitaker's chin. Uh, Chin, you know, he's going against a heavy style. It's, it's Yoel again. It's mm -hmm. another fight with Yoel. That's basically the same thing. I believe he has the tools and the footwork to beat Paulo, but it just all depends if his, if his chin can last on those punches. So I got Robert Whitaker and Kevin Holland and Brunson. One thing, Kevin Holland's amazing. Great person, but I'm going to tell you something. Pressure, build, or pressure blows up pipes. Burst pipes. The pressure that of the wrestling that Brunson has and pushing uh, the uh, all in backwards is going to take and nullify a lot of his game and end up, you know, it's going to take him down and it's going to take him out. If you watch the two people that pressured Holland to beat him, besides his, you know, fight when he jumped in on short notice, the two people that pressured him was. Uh, the boy from Duke Rufus' camp um, that went down to ATT with the long hair. Um, finished him in a rear naked choke, pressured him, took his back, rear naked choke. Uh, can't think of his name at the top. Brian Arnold, Allen, Ben Arnold, Allen, Allen, Allen. 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 Yeah. Brendan Allen. Brendan, Brendan Allen. Allen. Brendan Allen. Pressured him, put him down. Darren Stewart didn't beat him, but Darren Stewart pressured him. I believe he won that fight, but. Ended the fight dominantly. Him. Yeah, absolutely. So. And Those are good matchups. And then maybe Matthew Patolo or Julian Marquez throwing themselves into the mix. Oh, yeah. Preferably Julian Marquez, baby. But um, one word, give me one word, because I know you haven't been asking on your, your podcast. Give me one word to describe that Jake Paul versus Ben Askren fight, because I know you're going to talk about it a lot on your podcast. But if you have one word uh, for that fight. One word. Man. Excitement. Exactly. Okay, I like that. And then my final question, you guys both have fantastic nicknames. I'm just going to, like, the Cuban Missile Crisis is great, and then Coconut Bombs, you know, I, I kind of like that nickname as well. If, you know, who has the better nickname, I know you might say you, but do you give him credit a little bit for his nickname, or do you think it's, it's not that good? Dude, I love his name. I love out of the normal, uh, mm -hmm. you know, nicknames. When I think of his nickname, I think of Donkey Kong, or I think of like, you know, some like Crash Bandicoot style deal where you're like, they're throwing like fruit at people and blowing them up, you know, like the old school video Nintendo game. So like, it, it's amazing. It's, you gotta give credit where credit's due. It's, it's very unique, it's very awesome, and it's goes to his heritage, you know, like Hawaiian style, coconut, anything like that. And it, it's true. So I'll give him props. 
I don't battle people on the nicknames. If you got a good nickname, dude, you got a good nickname. Now, when you start going like assassin, you know, like that the Wolverine. common one, yeah, it's the same thing everyone uses all the mm -hmm. time. Like, come on, you know. I can't explain to you how excited I am to to watch this fight on uh, February 13th, pay per view, everything like that. Uh, it's going to be amazing. So good luck with that. Good luck with the process, making weight, COVID testing, whatever goes into that. Uh, we're excited. Thank you Fresh so media, much. So. Julian, thank you. Yeah, Appreciate for sure. You. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much.